Now, for the moment we've all been waiting for, this man presents India's most watched daily broadcast, the News Hour. A postgraduate from Oxford University and a visiting fellow at Cambridge University, he is widely acknowledged for his deep strategic insights into political and economic issues. He is much sought, sought after as a speaker at various national and international forums and is the recipient of several of the highest accolades and awards in journalism in India. The person we've all been waiting to hear in the flesh. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm and befitting welcome to our star speaker of the day, the man who takes the bull by the horn, the man who's changed the game of news reporting, the editor and chief of Times Now, Arna Goswami. When you say things like, take the bull by the horns, you raise expectations. <laughs> I am very happy to be here among all of you and to all members of the BMBA family. On this very important occasion for you, thank you for calling me and giving me the opportunity to speak to you. It's an honor uh, and it, uh, I've been very happy to reschedule my morning. And no, I haven't started doing a program at 10.30 yet. <laughs> You know, television anchors sometimes get a great sense of their self-importance. I have a theory that even if you put a cow at 9 o'clock and you present the broadcast to 25 million people, it will be a very famous cow. <laughs> I have no illusions about my importance. Two days back I was in Delhi and a few students from Amity School wanted to interview me for their school magazine. It's great fun talking to them. At the end of it, they said, we have a rapid fire now. Uh, one question was, uh, what will be the last line of your autobiography? <clears throat> As someone who's always prided himself on being a relatively young editor, I was a bit taken away. I said, it's a bit early. He said, no, no, we insist. So I thought and I said, uh, the last line would be, and the story was never the same again. And that is what drives me. In your conference, you have three words that are driving this meeting. I think the first word of your theme is enable, the second word is change, and the third word is thrive. I want to speak to you about change. And I found that incredible uh, number of quotes out there. I like one quote which says, change before you have to. And I like the fourth quote which says, <coughs> Change is the only constant. Hanging on is the only sin. I want to change the way journalism is done in this country. And I want to change it forever. And that is why I told those students that the last line of my autobiography, whenever it is written, should be that the story was never the same again. Because the story that you have been fed, that you have been told, the story you read, the news you take at face value, the news reports you watch, sometimes the discussions you see and the people you idolize are not what they appear to be. And I know it because I lived for 10 years in Delhi, in the center of India's journalism. I was completely disillusioned with what I had been part of. There is a clique in our country which is the news clique. They decide what the news is. They're all in each other's hair. They're a self-contained group. I call them the Delhi Gymkhana circuit. They're all very happy with each other. They go to the same parties, attend the same social events. They meet each other every morning for dinner, every evening uh, for dinner, breakfast, lunches, seminars, cocktail circuit. India-Pakistan meetings, seminars, high-flying events. The fact is that they're all part of one same circle. And I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, they don't like times now. Because we are not part of that clique. We've broken the clique. I call that clique, in a very colloquial manner, 
I call it Baba Lok Journalism. You know what Baba Lok Journalism is? When the sons and daughters of bureaucrats and politicians representing the self-preserving elites of India present to you a journalism that has no relevance to the people of this country. <laughs> they lack the courage to ask the straight question and they say this is neutrality. They will speak more on behalf of Pakistan than on India if there is a dispute between the two countries and they call it objectivity. They will not ask a person like Musharraf the question on Saurabh Kalia and they will call it decency. They will sit together in a coquettish manner and smile a few feet from Suresh Kalmadi and ask him, Mr. Kalmadi, can I ask you an important question? And Mr. Kalmadi will step forward and say, yes, please do. And the investigative question will be, Mr. Kalmadi, are all the charges against you false? <laughs> Mr. Kalmadi will say yes, and they will carry it as breaking news. Like Mr. Suresh Kalmadi says all the charges against him. <laughs> I have a few questions to ask you today in the context of change. My first question is this, because I see myself as one of the small agents of change in Indian journalism. I want to create a new generation of journalists in this country who will forever challenge the system and draw more talent into this profession. My first question is, in an obvious choice between right and wrong, when facts will stare you in the face, is it a virtue to be a fence sitter? That's my first question. I ask myself this question every morning. When I joined this profession, I was 21 years old, I was told in the first few days, remember one thing, you have no opinion. And I was completely shocked. Why had I joined this profession? You have no opinion, you have no right to have an opinion. There is no right and there is no wrong. And there is only one form of journalism which is factual journalism. I was a student of anthropology before this. And when I was studying at Oxford, we used to admire the fact that British civil servants, when they were serving in India, used to produce something called the Gazetteer of India, in which they used to write all kinds of garble, including the size of the head and brain of Indians and what it means, what Indians eat, who met whom. It was a telegraphic report which was sent to London every few days, telling the masters in London that this is the state of affairs in this colony of ours. It was the Gazetteer of India. Ladies and gentlemen, journalism in our country for 50 years after independence had been reduced to becoming the journalistic gazetteer of India, where the front pages of newspapers were full of what ministers said and nobody questioned the ministers. The CAG reports, the scams, the children who died in ditches, the rapes, the murders, the political killings, the riots, even the Bhagalpur riots of Bihar appeared in page number 4 because it was not considered good enough to be on the front page. Therefore, my question to you is this. If I have a choice between right and wrong, should I sit in the middle and say, no, I cannot be on either side because I am a neutral journalist? I'll give you one example. In December 2010, a teenage girl was raped by a very powerful MLA in the Banda district of Uttar Pradesh and so the girl went to a police station and the police inspector framed her and arrested the girl putting charges of theft against her so the girl who had been raped by the MLA ended up being locked up in the police station what does an editor do at a time when an obvious case of injustice such as this under the traditional definition of neutrality the common refrain would be, let the law take its own course and let it be. A lot of people say, let it be. The law will take its course. You are neither judge, nor jury, nor executioner. And you will stop at the point of saying, girl, 17, raped, arrested, law will take its course. My question is, is this the reason why we became journalists? Is this objectivity? Let me give you another example. 
in September 2009. A talented man called Manu Sharma. Have you heard of Manu Sharma? <laughs> Among his many talents is to go drunk and start shooting point blank range in bars. So this man was released from jail on a 30 day parole to attend in official language uh, to his ailing mother. His mother was very sick technically. And to perform rituals related to the death of his grandmother. During the second extension of the parole for another 30 days, nice television footage came out of this man in a completely intoxicated state, unable to control himself in a discotheque. I don't know whether that amounts to attending to your ailing mother. His ailing mother was part of a gathering of socialites launching a new cricket tournament at the Piccadilly Hotel in Chandigarh. What should I do in a case like that? Should I say, Manu Sharma, 30, parol, dancing, mother, inaugurating cricket tournament, story ends. I have the choice to do that. And I don't know why you're astonished about it. Because for 60 years, this is exactly the journalism we have had in this country. I am astonished that this is the journalism we have had. But today I'm talking to you and I'm sure you're astonished at that possible gazetteer of India, so-called fake neutral, pseudo-objective journalism, which has passed off as journalism. Because you today are more awakened because of the journalism we see. What is public interest? Why have I joined this profession? Am I a person who has joined this profession only to be the mouthpiece of politicians and vested interests? How will my career grow? At the height of my career, what am I seeking? Am I seeking to be brought into the same social club and told, Mr. Arnab Goswami, you are now part of us. Is that neutrality? That's my first question to you. My second question which I have for you is, what is a headline? What should be on the front page and what should be on the inside page? Let me tell you another story. Sanjay Dutt, uh, the film actor. He, in July 2007, was making one of his many appearances in and out of uh, jail. Now, however tiresome Sanjay Dutt is, his antics have become, however irrelevant he is even to the film industry, the media is obsessed about film personalities going in and out of jail. So in July 2007, like any other aggressive television editor, I too was following Sanjay Dutt going from Arthur Road Jail to Pune was being taken to another jail, I think the Yerada president Pune. And it was amazing. Apart from television, cameras being mounted on choppers, everything was happening. There was Sanjay Dutt being carried at a speed of 100 in a police van. There were 20 television OB vans running behind him. There were cameramen to the left and right. There were cameramen who were jumping onto the bonnets of their cars to get a side shot of Sanjay Dutt. There was complete drama going on. Sanjay Dutt was waving happily to the, to the cameras. There was a huge, dramatic television event happening right before us. Editors were biting their nails. Aj Tak would call IBN, have you got the first shots? Can we share it with you? I have got a shot of his fingernails. Mujhe haat ka shot hai, mujhe chere ka shot hai. It's drama going on. I too was part of the drama. The one big media circus, Sanjay Dutt, moving. July 2007. Now I was in the state of tremendous excitement. At 3 o'clock when Sanjay Dutt was finally on his way and we had done what we had to. I got a phone call in my office. And this person comes on the phone and he says, is that Arnold Goswami? I said, yes. He says, Arnold, you don't know me, I'm calling from Bangalore, I'm so and so. I have followed your career, I've followed you, your channel, for a long time. But I just called to say today that after today, I will never ever watch either Times Now or you or any news channel ever again. I was completely taken away. It's like a reality check. 
and ask this person what is happening. I don't know you, and may I ask you what is the reason for this provocation? The gentleman says, I have a friend, and my friend's name is Colonel Vasant Venugopal, and he was a commanding officer of the 9th Maratha Light Infantry. He says, Oh no, while you were covering Sajjeda half an hour back, his cremation took place, and there was not one TV camera. A 42 year old officer of the Indian Army. And let me tell you the story of Colonel Vasant Venugopal. July 2007. Keep two images at the back of your heads, ladies and gentlemen. On the left hand side of your screen, imagine you're watching a channel. On the left hand side, you have the story of Sanjay Dutt and his remarkable antics. And on the other side, troops of the 9 Maratha Light Infantry who spotted a group of heavily armed infiltrators near Khoreta, which is 15 kilometers north of Puri town. The terrorists on being detected, and I'm reading a Press Trust of India report from that same day, failed to escape towards the Pakistani side of the line of control. Troops occupied dominating positions and prevented the infiltrated terrorists to escape. Leading from the front and defending his men who were reporting to him, Colonel Vasant Venugopal, CO9 Maratha Light Infantry, personally rushed with reinforcements to supervise the operation. Under his determined and resolute leadership, his troops in a deft move surrounded the terrorists in a difficult and thickly wooded forest area. In the heavy firefight which ensued, Colonel Vasant Venugopal personally flushed out every militants, but he got himself into a situation where to protect his men, he took the fire and was fatally wounded. I had no words to reply to this man. I had never in my entire life and that is why I'm here before you today and when I was told about change, I too have changed. And this incident changed me. How flippant can I become? How TRP driven can a journalist get? Why are we editors? What am I here for? To cover Sanjay Dutt? Is that all that it comes down to? Why did I not cover Colonel Basant Venugopal? So I told this friend, I said, I'm very sorry for what has happened, sir. And I would like to invite you at 9 o'clock today to come on my show and talk about your friend. He said, yes, and he put down the phone. And so the show began. And instead of leading with the story of Sanjay Dutt, that evening I began with the story of Colonel Vasun Venugopal. I quickly got the pictures from the Doordarshan cameras of his cremation. I put together a profile. I spoke to his family members. And 30 seconds before a discussion starts, you should be asked the producer, do we have the guest online? He said, my producer said, yes, she is there. And I said, she? But I thought it was his friend who I spoke to this morning, and he was a man. He said, no, he's not come, but his wife has come today on the program. I did not know how to react. So, Suvashini Vasant, who was his widow, who had just cremated her husband four hours back, came on my program. And for 15 minutes as she spoke, I had no questions to ask, I had nothing to say. She spoke about her pride for her husband. She spoke about the loss. She spoke about how her children were coping with the tragedy. She spoke about how proud she was to be a martyr and an army officer's wife. She spoke about her family members who were in uniform. And she thanked me at the end of it for giving her an opportunity to speak about her husband. In my entire professional career, I have never faced a moment when I have seen quite clearly and been told that or not, if there is a need to change, the change is now. And that is the quote which I saw out there. Change before you have to. The second quote which is most apt. That afternoon and that evening in 2007, the message coming clear to me from somewhere was, change before you have to. If you want to be in this profession, change the profession, because the profession of journalism needs a change, and it needs it now. Uh, whatever I have done after, whether it is the 2G scam, the CWG scam, the Devas Isro scam, any of the scandals, the 2611 coverage, the gang rape or my questions of Pakistan are all directed by the fact that I think the time has come for the people of this country to bring forth a form of journalism that actually represents their interests, does not just titillate them. Covering Sanjay Dutt is titillation. Doing what we do today is not titillation anymore. It is change. My last question to you today. 
is this the inconvenient truth why do we shy away from taking a position why do we not call a spade a spade why are we squeamish about coming to terms with the reality why is it that one group of people defend pakistan then the same group of people go to Kashmir and they say, liberate Kashmir. The same group of people say, separatists from Kashmir on Indian passports must be allowed to go and meet Hafiz Said. The same group of people say, Maoists are not terrorists, they are Gandhians. <laughs> the same group of people, large number of them will go and attend a seminar funded by a man called Five who is on the payrolls of the Inter-services intelligence in Pakistan. Why are we not seeing this? I'm asking you today. You sit in Mumbai and whenever I go in Mumbai, I only ask myself one question. There is a lot of what is this news clique is happening in Delhi. Why do we not call a spade a spade? How many more children will die in Maoist terror? How many, how many more people will be killed? How many more panchayat leaders in Jammu and Kashmir will be abducted and killed? How many more seminars funded by the ISI will be exposed before we call a spade a spade? Do you remember the story of Syed Ghulam Nabi Fai? I, I covered that story. I was completely amazed. Because the fact of the matter was, 